Okay, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Naomi in a moment, and uh, Melissa will be reading uh, the scripture that we've been dwelling on this past week. Uh, but before I hand over to Naomi, who will be speaking, I just want to pray uh, for her and for us as we listen. So, Father, we thank you that you speak to us, that you are not uh, a silent God an ancient God, but God, that you are alive and through your Holy Spirit, you come and you speak to us. We thank you for what your son said and for the challenge of his questions uh, when he was here on earth. But Father, we thank you that right now today that you want to speak to us, to encourage us, to challenge us, to um, draw us on. So, Lord, would you come and speak to us? Be with Naomi as she shares. May your Holy Spirit just prompt her. Uh, and, Lord, give us open hearts to receive what you have to say to us today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Naomi, over to you. Thank you so much, Ashley. That's great. I love that reminder that God is still speaking to us and continually speaking to us. Um, in a minute, minute, Melissa is going to read our passage. Uh, as Ashley said, we're in the middle of this series about, about questions, about questions that God asks us in Scripture. And uh, this morning, if you've got your own Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew 16, starting at verse 21. And uh, while Melissa is reading, you might like to think about some of the questions that you've got about this passage. Um, as Ashley said, it's, it's a bit of a challenging passage, but I'm also really excited about what God might do through these questions with us this morning. Um, but you might want to start by thinking if you have any questions about this passage, maybe pop them in the chat for other people to read um, and then we'll dig into it together. So I am going to try and bring up the scripture on our screens. And then, Melissa, if you would read that for us, that would be great. No problem. Um, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Then Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What, will, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world, yet forfeit their own soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will award, sorry, reward each person according to what they have done. Truly, I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Great. Thank you, Melissa. So um, sometimes when I'm looking at a Bible passage, I find it really helpful just to note down the questions that I have about it. And they might be kind of simple things that I can look up, like where was that place or who was that person? Um, they might be harder things to find out, maybe things that I never get the answer to, like what was in that person's mind when they said that? Um, but this is some of the questions that I had about this passage when I first started looking at it. Um, why is Jesus so harsh with Peter? It seems like quite a, a, quite a, a firm response that he gives him. Um, what was that about? What are the rewards that Jesus talks about at the end of this passage? What does that look like? Um, Jesus uh, kind of rebukes Peter for focusing on human things. So what were the human things that Peter was focusing on? What was in his mind there? What did Jesus mean by this word soul? 
you know, we in the West have one understanding of what a soul is. Um, was that what Jesus meant or was he talking about something different? Um, how do you forfeit your soul? What does that look like? What does that mean? And then the last question that I had about this passage was whether the questions that Jesus was asking were purely rhetorical. Um, I think they're partly rhetorical. That is, he's using them to make a point. But I wondered whether they could also be kind of discipleship questions. And by that, I mean uh, questions that we can ask ourselves or we can allow Jesus to ask us that help us dig into our into our hearts a little bit and work out what is going on and partner with God in his transforming work. So I'm going to read uh, the questions in the centre of this passage again. Let me again bring them up uh, on our screens. Jesus said to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow me. Whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So this passage talks in a number of different ways about gains and losses, about rewards and sacrifices. And the stakes are high. He's talking, as I've said, about our souls. Now, getting, uh, certainly I found getting my head around what a soul is and where it is and what, what is being talked about here quite tricky, um, particularly as um, the New Testament is written in Greek and Jesus would have been speaking probably in, in Aramaic, which is related to Hebrew. And these two cultures had quite different understandings about this word. Um, but Jesus being a Jew and talking here to Jews, um, I think it's fair to say that he probably would have had a Jewish understanding about what a soul is. Now, if you want to dig into this a bit more, there is a fantastic four minute video by The Bible Project that I'll try and put up on our Facebook page later today that goes into this in a bit more detail. Um, but essentially, the, the Hebrew understanding of soul was that it was your whole person. It was your your living, breathing human self. So Jesus seems to be talking about something fundamental, something core to our existence. And in fact, um, where this passage uses the word life and the word soul, they're the same word. And if you look at other translations, they will say life throughout this, this passage. So it talks about forfeiting your life rather than forfeiting your soul. And again, this word forfeited, what does that mean? Uh, it can mean to be damaged or injured in some way. It's also used when talking about financial losses. So there's something here about my my very self, my very being that can be damaged or or even lost by my own efforts to preserve it. Now, I'm sure uh, you can remember back at the beginning of lockdown what it was like to go shopping in the supermarket and you'd go in and there were just kind of rows and rows of fairly empty shelves. There was no tin tomatoes. There was no rice. There was no pasta. There was no bread. There was no flour. Um, lots of things weren't available. And we were in, we had to self-isolate completely at the beginning of lockdown for a couple of weeks. And so I remember going shopping when our cupboards were also looking quite bare. And as I was walking to the supermarket, I had this sense that God was saying to me, uh, don't, don't take more than you need and don't take the last one of anything because you don't know who might be coming behind you that needs it more. And so I'm going around the shops going, don't take more than you need, don't take more than you need, don't take the last one of anything. And then I come to the tins aisle and there were three tins of tomatoes left on the shelf. Now, quite regularly when I go shopping, we'd buy kind of a big four pack tin tomatoes, maybe more, we use them quite a lot. Um, so I could quite easily justify to myself that I needed all three tins of tomatoes. But I'm going, oh, I feel like God said, don't take the last one. So I'm kind of stood there in the supermarket, having this little wrestle with myself, uh, all the while kind of looking around to check that no one else wipes them before I've decided how many I'm gonna take. But I kind of I came to realise, and this may seem like a really trivial example, but that there is something in me that would wither a little bit, that would begin to die almost if I went against what I felt God had been saying to me. And I didn't sort of think this through fully at the time, but as I was reflecting about it afterwards, um, something came to mind that I'd read back when I was in Bible college that Martin Luther wrote about what sin is. And he talked about sin as being humanity curved in on itself. And the image that he portrays is that sin is where we are so focused on ourselves, we end up kind of curving inwards, we turn inwards, we become increasingly kind of twisted in on ourselves and progressively less human. 
because selfishness is something that turns us away from other people, turns us away from God and just fills our vision with us and our needs. And there's no room for anything else. And I think Jesus is saying in this passage, you think that by putting yourself first, you're going to save your life. But the reality is that that road of self-preservation, self-promotion, self-interest, it's actually self-destruction because whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Now, I don't know if you have ever tried to say to yourself, I'm just going to be less self-interested. I'm just going to be a less selfish person. I'm just going to will myself to be different. Um, maybe you've had more success with that than me, but certainly my experience is that that doesn't pave the way for any meaningful change. But this is where I think the genius of Jesus's first question comes into play. Because I think one of the things that he's doing is magnifying the gains and the losses that we're dealing with so that we can see them a bit more clearly. So going back to my supermarket example, clearly it was not really about the tin of tomatoes. OK, firstly, uh, me and my family were never in any danger of, um, of really going hungry or starving. And even if we were, a couple of tins of tomatoes was not going to make the difference. Likewise, um, a trolley full of supermarket food was not going to stop us from catching the virus, which is what all of us were worried about um, at the time. And many of us, of course, still are. But what was I believing that it might do? Let's let's scale it up a bit. And I think it helps. It certainly helps me to see what's going on. What would gaining the whole world have looked like in that scenario? OK, maybe it would have been um, some huge warehouse just for our family that was filled with uh, pasta and rice and all of these things that we we were looking for. And as I kind of think about that possibility, as I imagine it, I notice that I'm feeling a little bit less, less anxious. I feel like I'm standing on more solid ground. I feel a bit more in control and able to cope with what's going on around me. OK, so this isn't really about tin tomatoes. This is something about security or control over my circumstances. And it's as we begin to name some of these things, we can invite Jesus into those experiences. So I can pray, Jesus, I'm feeling really anxious. I'm desperately trying to gain some control in such an uncertain situation, but I don't want to curve in on myself. I don't want to damage my soul by becoming so preoccupied with myself and my own needs that I, I go down this path of selfishness. Will you please help me? What is it I need to know? What is it you want to tell me here? So in a minute, I'm going to look at Jesus's second question, but I'm wondering if we can just pause just for a minute and uh, think about a couple of questions. I wonder if as I'm speaking, there are some similar examples, perhaps from your life, that you can think about the story that I shared. Situations where you, you acted or maybe you attempted to act from this place of, of self-preservation, selfishness even. I wonder what gaining the whole world would have looked like for you in that moment and what it was you were really looking for. So I'll move on a minute, but let's just spend a few moments of quiet thinking about these things. Okay, I appreciate uh, not giving you very long at all, but that's a conversation you might like to pick up with Jesus a bit later on today. The second question that Jesus asks um, is kind of the other side of the same coin. So let's look at that one just for a few minutes. What can anyone give in exchange for their soul? What is it we actually do gain by following Jesus? And what is the cost? Because I think as well as identifying what it is we're really looking for from the world when we're trying to gain the whole world, if we're going to see anything change in our hearts, we need to really believe that Jesus has something better to offer us. 
especially as Jesus leaves us in no doubt in this passage that the path of following him is not always easy. Many of us might be familiar with uh, Jesus' words in John 10, where he says, uh, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. But I wonder what comes to mind for you when you think about abundant life. What does that look like? Looking at another verse in Hebrews 12, we read that for Jesus, it was the joy that was set before him that allowed him to endure the cross. Jesus had a vision. He saw something that could only be achieved by him going to Calvary. And he said, yeah, that's worth it. It's worth the cost. It's worth everything I'm going to go through. Now, if we rewind this passage a little bit to the verses preceding the ones that we've read, Jesus asks his disciples another couple of good questions um, that, again, we could dig into, but we're not going to look at just now. Uh, but he asks his disciples, what's everybody saying about me? Who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? What do you think? And uh, in that moment, Peter gets it. Peter declares that Jesus is the Messiah, the one that Israel has been waiting for, their deliverer, their redeemer, their expected king. And amazingly, Jesus then gives Peter a role in this work. He says, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church. And he goes on to say, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Now, we don't know how much time passes between this bit of the story and the, the passage that we just read. But I imagine that Peter has spent quite some time thinking about Jesus, his words in the intervening period. Him with the keys to God's kingdom. I wonder what, what images that brought to his mind. Maybe what daydreams he had about that power, that status, um, maybe extracting some revenge from the Romans, uh, maybe putting right some injustices that he saw around him. But then Jesus goes on to explain in this passage the direction that his ministry is going in. And that rather than some glorious military takeover that, that perhaps the disciples had imagined, Jesus's victory is going to be something very different. He's going to lay down everything right to the point of being killed. And it's from there that new life and transformation is going to break forth. That is how Jesus's kingdom is going to be inaugurated. And Peter can't handle it. He just says, no, absolutely not, Lord. It can't be that way. But Jesus goes on in this passage to say not only to Peter, but to all of his disciples, if you want to follow me, not only do you need to accept that that is what I'm going to do, but you also need to be willing to walk this path of self-sacrifice. Now, of course, what Jesus accomplished on the cross was a unique thing that none of us are ever going to have to replicate. But there is something here about us needing to deny ourselves and follow him. But remember what Jesus said to Peter about focusing not on worldly things, but on God's perspective. I wonder if he was reminding Peter to remember the vision. Remember what it is I've said that I'm going to do. And remember what it is I've said I'm going to do through you. Remember, on this rock, I will build my church and I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. What is it that you're willing to give in order to walk into the kind of life that I am offering you? Now, one of my spiritual practices over the past few months has been centered around the Beatitudes and uh, several times a week I have recited them. In fact, actually, I've I've sung them because I find it easier to focus and to remember uh, to remember them. And so several times a week I've gone through in my mind uh, the words for the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted and so on. And so back back at the end of May when I'm sure all of us will remember George Floyd was murdered by a US police officer and some really long overdue conversations started both sides of the Atlantic about race and racism and some of the systemic injustice that we have in our society still today. I was reading and watching what was going on and listening to some of the debate that was going on and the various responses that people were giving and just rolling around my mind were these words, blessed are those who hunger for justice, they will receive what they desire. Blessed are those who suffer for justice, the last beatitude, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Because the reality is that me as a white person, I live in a system where I'm routinely advantaged just because I'm white. 
Now, there's a lot of research that shows that unjust systems are bad for everybody, regardless of where you fall in the kind of hierarchy that they construct. But because I benefit from this current system, working for justice, working to change that system might feel that it's going to cost me. And so often without even realizing it, I can do things that reinforce the status quo because it benefits me. And again, if we aren't able to name some of this, if we can't identify it um, and identify what we feel the cost is to us of losing it, then I might put up a sign in my window or I might go on a march or I might talk about wanting to change the system, but I might not actually do anything. Because Jesus in the Beatitudes talks about being willing to suffer for justice or for righteousness you might have in your Bible. It's this idea of being willing to pay the cost for God's kingdom to come about, for things to be put right the way that God intended. But if I'm really honest, there are times when I'm not willing to be mildly inconvenienced or made a bit uncomfortable or for things to be done in a way that I wouldn't choose or is unfamiliar to me because it costs. It's hard. It's not easy. But what I need and I think what we need is a more beautiful vision of the kingdom that Jesus is building, a fuller understanding about what life in all its fullness looks like. Because otherwise I'm just gonna keep clinging to the power and the comfort, the social benefits, or what all the other things are that I currently feel like I gain. Now that's just one example. We could think of many other ways that we are longing for the kingdom of God to come in our world. But I think we also need to ask ourselves, is there a cost to us of seeing that come about? Now the amplified version of this, uh, of this verse, puts it like this, it's a bit wordy, but it says, what would a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Now, of course, I'm not saying in any way that we earn our place in God's family, and um, I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here. But he is saying that there can be a cost to living the way that he calls us to live. And I think the cost that I'm willing to bear is directly linked to the vision I have of the life that Jesus is offering. Do I think it's worth it? So as we finish in a minute, we're going to sing another song that Drew has prepared for us. But as we finish, I'd like to invite you to imagine that Jesus has come to sit with you in your living room or your kitchen or your garden or wherever you happen to be just now. And spend some time speaking to him about the abundant life that he is inviting you to. And maybe being honest about what the cost might be. How do you feel about that? But I also wonder how Jesus might want to expand your vision, our vision of the kingdom of God and what it is he longs to see in our lives and in the lives of the other people that are around us. So let's have a few minutes of quiet and then I will hand back to Ashley. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for your patience with us as we work through some of the darkness in our hearts, some of our selfishness and some of our um, restricted vision. 
But Jesus, I want to invite you to continue to expand our vision of the life that you invite us to. God, would you show us what it is you long for in our lives, in our community, in our church, in our nation, in our world. And thank you that you walk with us on our journey with you. Amen.